Hello, ladies and gentlemen and champagners. Welcome back to the Champagne Rugby Podcast. And on today's episode, we're lucky to have no other than Jonathan Davies, OBE, a.k.a. Jiffy. Jonathan, how are you doing? Yeah, OK. I'm the old Jonathan Davies, not the young one, OK? So you have to do that and I have to say that in rugby circles. And you've just been off in France commentating over the last few weeks on the World Cup. How's it all been for you? Yeah, it's been really enjoyable. I think it's uh, the weather's been amazing. You know, to watch it, maybe not to play, um, but uh, yeah, as for see, coverage has been, you know, very good actually, and I've really enjoyed being with them. Um, very professional, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, as uh, as most World Cups are. But uh, from where we were uh, in in the Six Nations, I think we'd uh, we've ex- exceeded expectations and disappointed. Really, we're not in the semi final. Yeah, but, uh, France. I think France have been great. They've, they've been great hosts. Um, you know, stadiums have been brilliant. The, the the cities have been great, and there's been a lot of travelling supporters there. So it's I think it's uh, it's been a, a huge success for France, apart from losing last uh, weekend, I suppose. That was a close match between Argentina and Wales. It was really came down to the last scruff of the minute. It was, you know, they played. They tried to play and do put a play on, and Sanchez read it and scored. So. Um, it was it, it it was always going to be close. I felt um, you know all, all quarterfinals were going to be close, um, but with Wales, I think they'd done exceptionally well against Fiji. Um, maybe Australia disappointed everyone really, and I think it's maybe the worst Australian side I've ever seen. Um, and so we you know we dispatched them quite comfortably. Um, but then I always expected Argentina to you know turn up on the day. You know they performed badly against England. Uh, England controlled them. Um, and then they hadn't really sparked until they showed little glimpses against Japan. So I knew you know they they would come. They would be they would be well prepared with Michael uh, Chekai. He's um, a Czech. He's he's a very good coach. Uh, he understands you know their kind of mentality. Uh, I think he's a bit um, emotional character himself, and he knows how to play. You know how he knows the Wales game very well. So I knew I knew they would come, and we we started well. We we spread the ball well. We kicked intelligently. And I think in the second half, you know, we kicked aimlessly a little bit and uh, we gave them possession, which they kind of lapped up and they took momentum of the game and, and carried the ball through the phases, which they've learned to do in uh, in Super Rugby. So um, it was disappointing because I know people will come back and say that um, uh, you, you're going to get the, the, the teams that kicked the most in the, in the quarterfinals went through. Yeah, but you have to watch when they kick, how they kick and... and 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 then that's that's the key. You know, they get they they kick when they're under pressure. They don't kick aimlessly. They kick to compete. Um. So and they kick to pressurize. So I think um. You know, Wales Wales got that wrong. I felt. And do you think that's where the the main area that went wrong for Wales on the weekend? I, I think so. I think for me they were you know they were in control. The set piece was good against um against uh, Argentina. You know they suffered in uh, line out a little bit, but they got over that. Uh, got into a good position. I just felt because we'd played a tactical game where we kicked and then put pressure on the opposition. I think that's when um, you know that's we needed to do a little bit more against the better sides, and maybe that's where you know our kick were slightly aimless and, um, and and gave them you know easy possession to build their their phases on. I think they once they got into good field position, and you know that, I think that was the difference. Maybe we should have kept kept the ball and you know, kicked more intelligently. Do you think Warren Ga- do you think Warren Gatland will stick with Wales post World Cup? I read somewhere that uh, you know he did a post World Cup press conference and uh, he intends to to stay. I think he's seen enough in this group to you know to to realize maybe that there's a potential there to, to improve them in the next four years. Um, <clears throat> you know there, there's a few key issues that they have to address, uh, like you know the standoff position, the fullback position. Um, they haven't got the strength and depth there, but. Um, yeah, I think he enjoys Wales. He enjoys coaching Wales. He enjoys the challenge, and um, you know he's he's a realist, isn't he? That's uh, that's you know, and he and he creates good belief with insights. So I do feel that I think you know who knows in who knows in professional sport, you know what happens. But uh, one bad Six Nations, and you could call it a day. But uh, yeah, hopefully he'll stay. You you're more in favour of him staying than leaving. Then uh, I don't think maybe I. I Maybe I wasn't in favour when he came back, um, because I felt that we maybe had to develop our game a little bit more. Because um, you look at the the teams that adapt, maybe are the better sides. 
So, um, but no, you know, he's done a great job and, uh, you know, you, you can't really question what he's done and, and how he's turned this team around in a short a short space of time. I'll tell you what I was really impressed with from the Wales camp and the Welsh point of view from the World Cup was Jack Morgan. I think he really stepped up and won a lot of, not just Welsh hearts, but international hearts from England, Scotland, Ireland. And he, he really... St- Stamped down his uh, yeah. mark for for that captain's jersey. I think he's 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 quiet. You know, he is a real nice guy. Um, you know, didn't wasn't handed out to in his professional career that you know he gets good knockbacks and the work hard of it. And um, I think he's maybe not one of these who've been in the system for too long. And uh, oh my God, this dog, this dog, or this dog. So this is he hasn't he hasn't been in the system too long. So he's. He's still got that kind of natural ability that um, you know he, he has. So he's he's one of those things where he plays the game, you know, to a structure. But then he also then plays a game where his instinct kicks in. So he has the ability to run the pass. He's, he's deceptively quick. He's great over the ball, and I think he's well liked and respected in the you know in the camp. So you know he has he had a sensational World Cup. You know from coming from nowhere, really, and fighting for his place, to being a captain, leading from the front, and absolutely, you know, putting a, a fantastic display in, in both areas. Attack and defence, he was... Uh, yeah, you know, he, yeah, he was brilliant. And I think that, you know, he's, he has the ability to adapt and play both games. And uh, I, I think that they can, you know, do a lot around Jack. I think, um, you know, he's there for a long, long time. How old is he? He's quite young, isn't he? Yeah, you know, he's very young, early twenties, I think. So I can't remember off the top of my head. I've done so much stats at the moment. You know, they all they all fall into each other. So, but I think he's yeah, he's 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 new on the scene. You know, he's new. He's jumped from a couple of regions. Um, so I just feel that um, you know, he's he is a tremendous talent, and uh, you know, hopefully now he will grow into a you know an even better player. You know, with more kind of um, regional rugby. Do you think if maybe Fala Tao wasn't injured, it, it might have helped the final result because he's got that cooler head? Yes, if if some buts in there, you know, that's the thing. You can't, um, they have the opportunities and, and, I, and I think they, unfortunately they didn't take it. So <laughs> Fala Tao obviously would have been an asset because he's a tremendous player. You know, he does a tremendous amount of, of work that goes unseen by the, you know, the, the general rugby supporters. So, his covering and reading of a game is uh, is phenomenal. That's why, you know, he has been a standout player in Wales maybe for the last decade, uh, consistently. I mean, and um, you look at him and go, that's why he didn't t- participate in any of the warm up games really, and they and they kind of put him in cotton wool for the tournament. And um, you know, he repaid them as well. And just was unfortunate with a, you know, a broken arm. Yeah, and obviously Dan Bigger, his last World Cup as well. It's going to be interesting to see how. Wales feel that tension. Yeah, he's been there a long time, Dan. And uh, you know, whether you love him or hate him, you know, he's 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 a he's a winner. He just you know wears his heart on his sleeve. Sometimes that spills over, and people don't like that. But uh, I think he's one of these players where you really acknowledge him when you play with him. Um, and he was sorry, you know. I think his his leadership and attitude um, and his competitiveness. You know, will you know will be missed in the Welsh camp, and hopefully someone will take the you know those reins up and uh, and take Dan's place. But he's been a tremendous servant for for Welsh rugby. You know, he's a he's a great character. You know, off the field, he's a nice nice guy. Is off the field, and um, you know he he's you know he, all the plaudits that he got uh, were were thoroughly deserved. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's going to be some tough boots to fill. That's for sure. Yeah, it is, but it's an opportunity. You know. Um, Costello's a different player, or Costello, you pronounce he's a different player. He plays maybe on the front foot. But he needs time to adjust and to learn the game in the regional centre. And whether he gets the opportunity, um, you know, behind weak, maybe weaker packs is, is going to be, you know, a tough a tough thing for him. But, uh, you know, that's that's the only thing he can do is, is learn his trade now at the regional level. 100%. And talking of the other matches, then, obviously, the Ireland-New Zealand game, and South Africa, France. <clears throat> the results there, a lot of people were backing a Northern Hemisphere clean sweep. Were you surprised by the results? 
and I, I I tipped the Northern Hemisphere clean sweep, but I then I wasn't. I, I you know I said in the, when I when my predictions that you know you, you, I could get all four right, I could get all four wrong. And that's how that's how competitive the the four quarterfinals were. I thought you know Argentina in the end deserved their win. I thought France and Ireland were the better sides, um, but when you come up against you know quality opposition, it's all about game management and being clinical with the opportunities that uh, that you created and you know New Zealand I felt that you know they were blown away by South Africa in the, in the pre pre tournament game um but you, they've always got players who can do something on the day over and above the team effort and I think that's what happened you know when you see the tries Wanga shows and goes maybe there's a lapse in comp- concentration with Ireland which is very unlike Ireland and then that just keeps their noses in front you know then they have a good kick, a kick a big kick from Jody Barrett then you know, then Barrett chips and they just break the game up a little bit. And that's what they had to do against Ireland because Ireland were dominant in the first play and they were starved of possession. But they also, if you look at South Africa and uh, New Zealand, when it, you know, they do kick a lot, but they kick intelligently. They kick to clear their lines on an exit um, kind of ploy, but then they kick to compete and, and, and kick, you know, for, for field position and put the pressure on. So the, the kicking game is slightly different. It's an attacking force for them. And they did that. So, you know, the opportunities that South Africa created, you know, were, were fantastic. And the tries they scored. But those games could have gone either way. They could have gone either way. And um, it was just that, you know, the pressure games, maybe they were, they had more experience in them, the, the Southern Hemisphere side. But you can't take anything away from them because, to go, you know, to beat France in France and then and beat Ireland, the best team in the world, you know, you, you have to give them full credit. And, yeah, I was bitterly disappointed. I've been a Northern Hemisphere supporter. I wanted to see Ireland and France, you know, progress into the, you know, into into, into the latter stages, but the and unfortunately not. And then, yeah, you know, we had England. I always thought that England would strangle Fiji a little bit. They were in control, and then Fiji just flicked the switch and back they came. You know, they they they're a force of nature. I watched them, you know, against Wales, and they were they were very close and maybe should have won that game, but. Um, you know, they have tremendous individual players, but maybe it's the game management that, you know, that, that let them down a little bit. But that'll only improve when, you know, when they play more rugby, you know, in the in, in the Southern Hemisphere against the better sides, you know, as they are now in the competition that they're in. I really think <laughs> we need to get Fiji into the rugby championship. That that would be class. To get them more. It would be, I, it would be, would it, you know, it, it is difficult because a lot of them play in the in the northern hemisphere, but you know, I think they'll have an abundance of talent playing in the southern hemisphere, and then if that was the case, rather than go and play for Australia, New Zealand, they would then play, you know, for you know the Fijian side uh, in the in the Super Rugby and then in the in the Championship. Yeah. That. They need encu- they need encouragement, you know. <laughs> they've shown what they can do, you know. They've shown, you know, some more show what they can do. Um, Tonga and Fiji have. Uh, but then again, you look at Chile, Portugal, and Uruguay. They were all, you know, they were all brilliant, and they all played maybe a more attractive rugby than England and Wales. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. And the. Um... The Portuguese actually got an upset over Fiji. Their their first tournament ever in the Rugby World Cup, and they drew against Georgia. Came within twenty one points of Australia and Wales, and beat Fiji. That's tremendous. Yeah, you know, that's that was their world. That was you know their World Cup final. You know they would have maybe the draw was disappointing for them, but to get a, a, a result over Fiji, maybe Fiji took the eye off the ball a little bit because they knew what they had to do. And uh, but you know, in saying that, I was, I thought I I enjoyed I enjoyed all most of the sides in the World Cup. They, I think they were uh, a breath of breath of fresh air. I I agree. I agree. I loved watching Uruguay as well. They turned yeah, up all, against France. They were yeah. very... they all played exceptionally well, you know, and they and they, all, they were all confident in their ability. They all played a, a, an open, attractive game because they knew they couldn't get kind of involved in a in a slugging match. And um, I thought that uh, you know they. They played intelligent, smart rugby, and the crowds got behind them. I guess the the question is next. Then is what what is sort of next for these developing nations? Because obviously we've got developed tournaments like the Six Nations, like the Rugby Championship, where the Tier One nations get regular game time. 
yeah. I think that's that. Yeah, I think you know maybe there's a plate competition in the World Cup, and you play and you and and you look at those sides and play a second and or second tier competition, and then you have to assess the quality of that and if they are capable of jumping up to tier one, then you can kind of look at it if that is the case. But you know, or you just do a you know a a playoff game, one off playoff game, and see what happens. I think there is there. They have to look at them and they have to give them some kind of morsel to see that they, you know, there is an opportunity to, to you know, get a step up to the to the big table, so to speak. You know, and that's that's the same with Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji, and it's the same with Georgia, Portugal, you know, Uruguay, and all those now. So uh, you know, the, the strides that they've made have been are unbelievable, and they 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 can't just be blocked out because you know they'll just give up then so they need they need a light at the end of the tunnel so that you know they they can try and prosper and improve and and get to that top table something to strive for essentially would you <coughs> yeah it is would you be open to a round robin um six nations tournament that had relegation and promotion i think i think you have to you have to ensure that they're competitive so if there is a one-off playoff and they win, so you know the so be it, and they they're good enough to come there. But you know, unless you know, if they come up and get battered every week, so I think they have they have to have some kind of preparation to, to make that step up. I think Italy showed huge improvement until this World Cup where they were blown away. Um, so you know. If Italy don't improve now in the next few years, well, maybe there'll be you know calls for it again. But I think there has to be an avenue where they you know they have an opportunity. But I think we just can't throw them in and they get smashed every week. Yeah. They, you know there has there has to be some kind of common sense and a balance there. Who who out of the World Cup so far? Which teams? Which players have surprised you the most? Uh, I don't think anyone really has surprised you know. Fiji was one, if anything, you know how they, how good they were. Australia surprised me how poor they were. Um, I think you have to look at South Africa, really, an island that they were two sides, and then New Zealand always, always there or there about. So that no one's really, I am, you know, because they, you see so much rugby now. Um, I think the fact that yeah, Portugal would have surprised you, Uruguay would have surprised you. Um, because you 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 don't see much of them, or I you know I wouldn't have seen much of them. So um, yeah, that, those were the surprises that you know the the quality that they had, and really they you know they weren't they're not really good enough to mix with the better sides. But you know the way the the intent that they showed and the style of rugby that they played, I think was refreshing for everyone. How many games of rugby do you think you watch on a weekly basis? Yeah. I think there's so many now you can't watch too many. You know I think if you get if you watch three games in a day, you just you you know you have a kind of a brain freeze. You know, I'm not. I I watch a game that I want to watch, and I watch highlights. To me, you know, if I'm working on anything, I'll make sure that I watch those highlights and watch you know how those players are going. But <clears throat> I think too much of a a good thing. You, you know, you get sick of it. So um, I tend not to uh, not to watch ridiculous the amounts of of rugby because not all the games are good. They're monotonous, and I do think that. Every decision now is scrutinised, you know, so much that um, there's a lack of common sense. Um, so you know, it just gets a little bit of a, a minefield with people's opinions on social media as well. So, you know, I respect a lot of them, but some of them, some of them is total garbage. What they say, you know, and unfortunately, I'm not sure if you know the the important people listen to uh, a lot on social media. Like you mean up high up in world rugby sort of thing or the referee? I I I think there's you know there's a lot there's a lot of it that's kind of there's a lot of pressure from the from the social media you know you can't avoid this sometimes, <clears throat> but I think they gotta you know be brave and you know stick with their decisions. Uh, you know there's a lot of common sense. A red card is still a red card, and there's a lot of accidents. And uh, you know like, like, you look at example now you have the Tompkins were on the weekend with the Argentinian cleaning him out. You have different opinions about that. One say that the way he explained it was brilliant. He was going down. He closed it. It's all about the, where the where the arm and the shoulder was. 
lot of you know if you, if you haven't played at that level and realize how quickly you you the opposition changes, it's ridiculous, you know. So was that a yellow card? Some some say it would be, some say it wasn't, and then you got the Elsbeth uh, head clash. You know, he tries to lower, and then he gets a yellow card. So it's still such a minefield because it is a contact sport, and um, I think they need to bring a little bit more clarity to it. Um, and secondly, they have to kind of really get behind the referee. I think the referee on the field sometimes he gets is is get the instinct to see that natural speed. When someone looks at it in the bunker for you know for so many different angles and and a slow mo, they kind of try and steer away from what the referee wanted. So I don't know as long as they get the right result. But I do think sometimes they have to see what's an accident, what's deliberate, what's intent, you know, and, and mitigation circumstances. But I do think sometimes they've set the bar where any head connect, uh, contact now is a red or yellow card. It's a contact sport, and that's unavoidable. And I will preach that, having played both chords and you know had, had taken headshots, I know the priority is is the player's safety and health. But you have to have a little bit of common sense because it it is a contact sport, and you you you're going to have accidents happen. How would you tackle the inconsistency uh, with high tackles and red cards? Uh, the first thing I'd say is, and you know. When I say any head contact is is red, but, you know I, I, that's not the case for me. Uh, I think you've got to look at each one individually and say, right, okay, let's make a common sense. What's happening here? Maybe get an ex player onto the TMO just to sit next door to him, have a given input. He doesn't have to take it. The TMO, um, but it's it's it is going to you know you can't. It's, it is going to be very very difficult. And opinions. Everyone's going to have different opinions on on different situations, but it's very difficult to, you know, it, not every head contact can can be a card card a cardable offence, and that's the thing they got to work out that. And was you know intent? There's not there's not many people because they know if they do anything, they're often so. There's the intent. I think the the intent is gone now because you know if there's intent, you're straight card and you're off. The mistiming of a tackle and you know technique that's that's a really big one. You know most of the tacklers now the ones going in the head on the wrong side, they're not dropping their body. If you are dropping, then you know you, that's mitigating circumstances. It's so difficult, but I think you have to look at each case individually and and hopefully they make the right call. But then if you make you know you, it won't be the right call for everyone. Yeah, for me and, it... and, and I bet and I bet that the the latter on you know we, we go into competition. The more lenient the referees will be. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's pressure and deciding the outcome of, you know, of a semi final or a final on the card. It's you know, it's, it's basically it's not right unless you're mad. You were going to say intent. Go on. I think intent is the biggest factor for me, because yeah. if if a player is, he makes a mistake, he shouldn't. And he doesn't mean to make that mistake, and it's not malicious. For example, if they yeah. just bump heads, it shouldn't yeah. be a red card. It, it ruins, like it ruins the game. <sighs> there's no intent. You know, there's like you said, intent. When when previously, when the game, you know, you see clips on YouTube and everything, the the you can see there's intent there, and it's a red red card. And sometimes you miss someone misses with a punch. The intent is there because he hasn't connected. He doesn't get penalised. But for me, that's a red card. Yeah, yeah, you know, so that's little things like that. So, um, but it's you know, it, it's going to be a very difficult situation to handle, and just I hope that this common sense prevails. It feels like such a grey zone when it's it should be a bit more black and white, you know. Yeah, yeah, but when you have when you have humans involved, you're going to have human error, aren't you? Mm. In the in the participants and in the, in the decision making. But you know, just hopefully nine times out of ten, you can make come out with the right decision. Yeah, and what's your predictions for the semi-finals coming up? I think you know, I think both semi-finals will be closer than what they think. I think obviously you've got to go with New Zealand and South Africa. I think uh, Argentina, you know, will put up a fight up. They play against New Zealand 
you know, in a regular regular occurrence. So they know what to expect or they know how to front up. They know they have to start well, uh, to hang on in there um, and close those, but, you know, brilliant individual players down, uh, which will be difficult. But, I, you know, you do fancy the All Blacks. And then South Africa, you know, they've, they've adapted well now. They've got great individual players behind. They've got tremendous pace. You know, they start, you know, they, they've got choices now at standoff. Do they go, you know, with the kicker or the runner, or they then they can swap when needed, and of course they've got the power anyway. So, but I do think that England have the ability to frustrate them, hang on in there. Maybe then again you come down to decisions and referees and where you play the game, you get penalties. So I think that you know England will it'll be a lot closer than what people think. But then again, I think that the ability of the South Africans will come through. <clears throat> they they are and, on the side. Yeah, they are. Final, again, you go to the final, you think, you know, you have to look at, you know, there's the South Africans being the favourites, but the one thing about the All Blacks, they have, they have you know, ev- most of the players in the back line have the ability to break the line, um, make something happen, and that's what you have to do against very strong defences. So, you know, they showed that they can do it against Ireland, so who knows, you know, they could, they could do the same against South Africa. Yeah, unless... New Zealand's peaked early. That could be uh maybe an Ireland have peaked early by beating France. You never know. You yeah. know, so Argentina have peaked by beating um you know Wales. So yeah. and maybe England haven't peaked. <laughs> we'll, so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We're, wait- so, I mean, <laughs> we're waiting to the final to uh peak. You know, it's maybe it's maybe, maybe you never know. You never know. You know, they they had their final in the semi-final last year, then they didn't perform in the final, so they say, but South Africa didn't allow them to perform. So it'll be two interesting, you know, semis and the final will be interesting. So it's not, it's not kind of clear as cut as what people think. Who do you think will be like the key players in the semis for any of the teams to really stand out and that needs to perform? Uh, it all depends who England pick at uh, back row. I think they'll have to carry ball, not only one, no, but you know, via two, two of the you know the blind side that on the number eight they'll have to carry ball, and um, and two laggy. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see who they pick at full back as well, uh, yeah. whether they go with Marcus or they go with um, Freddie Stewart, because one of the things I, I, I one of the things I, I don't understand with England is you know when they don't score a lot of tries, you got Freddie Stewart who's maybe the best under the high ball, and then when they get to the you know. He's brilliant defensively, but they don't use him offensively. So when you know England won the World Cup in two thousand and three, Australia kicked a lot, a lot to Takiri, and he scored, jumped over Jason Robinson, and then they didn't do it again. I was thinking, why didn't do it again? If it's worked once, it'll work again. So that's why I don't. You know, England will be interesting to see who they pick at full back, and use that offensive uh, kicking game. You know, in the opposition twenty-two. So um, that'll be interesting. They got a carry ball. Um, so with the back row and Manny Tulagi obviously as well he'll have to be, have, have a big game to, to to make dents into the South African line um, oh, I think South Africa it could be any one of, of the players you know they've they've all can perform um, on their day you know they've even swapped the you know the, the scrum halves and where Faf was playing well they've got you know the, the bench is very very strong so they've got you know they can they can attack from anywhere New Zealand again is their their forwards. Um, you know, they will if they have parity. I think they win because their backs are so individual, so much individual brilliance that they can open defenses up. So, the better they have Moanga, uh, Barrett, um, you know, uh, Ioni, um, and then they got if you know Mackenzie if he comes on maybe you know they've got so much ability there. So there's I think there's it's, it's it's been a great work so far with great games, and I just hope that that you know you know keeps on going. Would you have liked to be commentating in the semis in the final? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think being you know I've been with the BBC for twenty odd years, and um, because ITV have I've never have always won it. I've never had an opportunity to do television commentary television. Um, <clears throat> so it's yeah, it's you know it's it's one of those things. I've I've done it on radio. I've done it for SOC. I've done it, you know, an ambassadorial role with, with different companies. 
but yeah, I would have liked to have the opportunity to do um, you know one World Cup or you know any other World Cups on 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 television. Um, but hey, it is what it is, isn't it? Yeah, with the S four C team though, you you've got Sarah, you've got Jamie Roberts, Shane Williams, and um, a few of Mike the Phillips, Mike, Mike Phillips, Phillips yeah, uh, Robin McBride, yeah, uh, Reese Reese Priestland, yeah, Jason Mohammed pitch side, so. You know, it was a good, uh, it was a, it was a professional set that done with Whisper. Um, and it was, um, you know, it's always easier when you're winning. You know, having commentated on Wales through, you know, the good and the bad, you know, 90s and then, you know, doing the, the when they won the Grand Slams, it is it is so much different. And, um, you know, so you, all the newbies now get, you know, frustrated and they, and they start, you know, Complain about the stick that they get on social media. I've had over 26 years. You've just got to, you know, it's part of the business, I'm afraid. And you're not going to please everyone. And then sometimes, you know, when wheels are going badly, you have to criticize them. Um, but the only thing you got to do is not make it personal, you know, and just, and then you win some, you lose some great games, grand slams, you know, wooden spoons, hey ho, that's sport. Do you get messages from people uh, about things oh, you said yeah. in the match? Yeah, you get abuse all the time. You always get abuse really? on social media. Whether you think you've had a good game or a bad game, whether it's rugby league or rugby union, um, you know everyone's got an opinion, it's, and it's an emotional platform. But you know, but don't take it personally. You know, yeah. I know, I know my. I think I'm quite. I think I know my rugby. Um, you know, I've been doing it for a long, long time. I've done the rugby side of it, played it, and then both codes and broadcasting for 26 years. So, um, yeah, you know, people just think you turn off, turn up like an empty, and just say what you think. You know, you don't do any research in there. So, um, yeah, just it's 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 been a brilliant. I've thoroughly enjoyed my career, you know, and I, and it's still ongoing for a couple of years. Um, it's you know, you play, then you finish, and you just do this, and you're very lucky to be involved in the game. What um, does a typical day or a tip? Let's say we've got a typical Six Nations match. What does a typical pre- uh, preparation look like for you? Well, you what the preparation won't start in the day. You know, you, you watch a lot of the games pre, you know, throughout the season. Just keep your eye in. You can't watch everything. See who's playing well. See who's playing badly. See what their, you know, their strengths and weaknesses are. So then you what, you know, you you watch the, the team selection. You look. I won't look at much of stats because I think that's the commentator's mm-hmm. job. You know, I look at what's been what's he been doing, like turnovers. Is he line outs, you know, defensively win tackles, miss tackles, you know, what's the success with the kick? So that that comes under the resource. But for me on the day then, you you know, you just wait and see what, uh, you know, selections are. Because things happen straight away in the morning of a match. Somebody's got flu or something. I'll turn up, uh, you know, run through the sides, uh, set lane. We'll have a kind of a meeting with, um, you know, with the broadcasters. Then you just try and, um, and call a game and enjoy it. That's basically it, because the work's been done throughout the season. With the stats that you receive, do you research them online yourself beforehand, or is there like, <coughs> are they I prepared think... by a team? You can do both. You can get weekly. You can get weekly stats because the information now is just, is unbelievable. Um, so you have week. You know, you can have weekly stats and and you know, um, locate them anywhere. Um, and then on the day, you know, you will have stats as well on players um, that, you know, you know, caps and, and this and that. So, you know, history in the Welsh jersey. So there's, but you know, sometimes, there's, you know, you can get an overload. You know, there's, you can get so much, there's so much out there at the moment, even as a player, you know, even now. If I knew that I was playing against a player who was quicker than me, stronger than me, um, you know, on form, would I take him on, you know, on the outside, or would I try and step him on the inside? Obviously, I would because you know you have you have to have your own beliefs. But sometimes you can't have stats intimidate you. You know, you've got to go out there and you know believe in your own ability. I think that's key, and then not not let you know the white noise get into your, get into your you know performance. I think that's key. You know, there's so much you know there's so much out there at the moment that you forget about basically playing. Yeah. See what's in front of you, and just commentate on what's happening in front. If you had yeah, one, you know. one piece of advice for 
budding commentators looking to get into the sport, what would it be? There's a couple really. Is um, one is allow the pictures to do the talking. Mm-hmm. That's one thing on television. Don't over talk each other. You know, you're trying to you know compete with the, with you got two commentators. Don't allow the pictures to you know to speak for themselves. Um, you have to simplify it just because the game is so complicated. Simplify it um, as much as you can. Um, I think that's it. that's important. Um, uh, and then you you can't you can't be personal with players. You know, players are always trying their best. They they don't try and make mistakes. Sometimes you know they will have an absolute nightmare of a day. But you know you have to keep it. You know you you know basic and uh, and professional. You can't make it personal whatsoever against the individual. Okay, so we keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate. Don't overtalk, and see what's playing in front of you. Yeah, and I think I think it's it's a simple job. The commentators say what's happening. The co commentators say why it's happening. So if you can explain to the general public who are watching, and they go, "Oh, I didn't see that," then you're doing your job properly. There's something's happened. So someone's gone into that gap on a drop off. Why is there a gap there? Something's happening in the back here. Someone's held someone back. Someone's been caught in a ruck or a mall. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's a gap opens up. Or someone's done something absolutely brilliant to beat someone and it's good. And which which commentators do you look up to that are still sort of going around? I, I think I respect a lot. And I still respect a lot of people. Um, you know, the commentators, I've worked with so many, you know, a lot of great people. Um, you know, they fortunate to work with. Eddie Butler and with you know Bill McLaren, um, and I work with with Ray French in rugby league, so I've been very very fortunate. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of good ones out there now. You know, uh, uh, Nick, I work with Nick Mullins. Um, I work with John Champion. Uh, I work with Alistair Eakin. So you know, all these um, all these people are you know are still great at their jobs. You know, so um, and you learn from a lot of other co co commentators. You learn from co commentators. Um, you look for, you learn from other sports as well. Um, you know, you listen to other sports and see how they analyze uh, analyze things. So, yeah, it's um, you know, you, you're learning you're learning every day really just by listening and watching other sports and other commentators and other, and other co commentators. And then for the final sort of roundup before we finish the podcast, what's your predict? Who do you think is going to win the World Cup? Um, I thought at the start I thought it'd be France. So you know, just decided to knock France out South Africa. I think you've got to go with them now. Um, now, but you, I think everyone's everyone's kind of you can't write off New Zealand because I think they have more individual brilliance than anywhere else. And then if you have parity up front and then that individual brilliance can win you win you those games you know you, you go above and beyond the team effort when there's a te- when there's two amazing teams and they're giving it everything you just need that moment of brilliance from someone and maybe New Zealand got more players with that moment of brilliance than anyone else do you think um, grassroots rugby plays a key role in how international teams perform? Um, no, I think they're two different games. I think the amateur game and the professional game are totally, you know, different. Um, that's, that's all you've got to do with the grassroots is um, give them knowledge, technical knowledge. Uh, and skill knowledge, you know, it's the technical to technical side is you know when you clear out um, rucks and because it's getting it's it's getting more far and more important now. You know the lineups and the scrums or whatever you're playing and the ability to you know run the right angles and everything, but also tackle tackle technique. Now I think you watch pro game, they go in too hard to hit and they get the heads in the wrong in the wrong position. I think that's vital to educate the young kids at a young age where to tackle properly. Um, and and you just work on core skills because in my in my experience, you the, the skill level. If you if you are competent at your skill level at that level, the only thing that increases is the pace of the game. Can you, and then you can adapt to the pace of the game because you co- you've got confidence in in your ability. 
Um, so I think that's vit vitally important. Now in the day, I think I know there's a lot of there should be a lot more mentoring going on for players because you know it's their livelihood. But you know there's a lot of things you have to manage where you know your your home life. Are you happy at home? Are you kind of doing your balance of home and work? Um, you know what if you're playing badly, if you're injured, do you need to do something running parallel to your to your career? I think then there's a lack of that because lack of preparation when something seriously happens and they've got to, you know, stop their career um, or when they finish, you know, they don't, they have nothing to step back into. So um, maybe they're more they're on the emotional side as well. Mentoring is important, I think. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people that I've been speaking to have commented and they said, what's happening with grassroots? Because they think grassroots rugby is sort of going downhill in Wales, I think, yeah. in England. Less and less to turning up and sides struggling to get sides. That, that's marketing. That, that that's got you know you can't. There's so many other avenues that children want to do now. You know if they're chucking it down on a Saturday or Sunday morning and they've got a computer and in the in the house, they've got to encourage them to go out and play. So you've got to enjoy what you do and you've got to look forward to doing it. Uh, so I think that marketing, funding. And making sure that the coaches that are doing those voluntarily are educated properly. So that's where maybe the finance is because I'm looking at Wales now and saying, right, okay, they haven't got the money that the other sides have got, so they can't get marquee players. So if they can't get marquee players or keep their marquee players, then the only way is in development. So they have to make sure that the, the resources go into development is really top notch that you know the kids coming through are quality, top 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 quality. You only can do that if you you know spend and the right resources in, in developing those kids. Yeah, this is a thing that an issue, or let's say, of that I think about a lot because I actually I was working in a job in sort of finance in London for before. I, so I quit my job recently to go and play. So I'm going to play rugby in China next month. So in like 14 days, I'm going to be on a plane to China to play mm -hmm. rugby over there and try and help bring a new market of rugby into China. So I'll be traveling mm -hmm. from Beijing all the way down to Hong Kong, playing with different clubs and then making like a mini sort of documentary or video showing okay. what it's like. And at the same time, though, I'm always thinking, how do we make rugby more one more popular like my main goal is to get get rugby as popular as possible but also you got to do that with the right funding and like you said it's it's marketing it's having the right uh message it's making yeah. sure people are seeing the sport that they want to play the sport um and it's like i get excited talking about this topic because it's something i spend so much time thinking about how can we do this how can we do that how can we do that and um I think with China, it will probably be the sevens will probably take off before fifteens. Because that's the an easy, it's, it's an easy game, you know. Yeah. It's an easy game, and it's a simple game. It's like anything else. Football is the biggest game in the world because it's simple. Apart from the offside, you just get a ball and you kick it about, and you put your jumpers down as a kid, and you score between those two jumpers, you know. Yeah. So that's the thing, but and I think you've got to make it enjoyable for kids, you know. And I I played a lot of sevens when I was was growing up. So, you know, enjoyed it and it worked on your skills. Um, but I had great I had great coaches who made it fun and I wanted to go back and it wasn't a chore. You know, I wasn't shouted at. You know, I wasn't screamed at. I wasn't like, you know, told to hit, hit tackle bags 300, you know, times, at, you know, in the session in the muddy rain. So you actually enjoyed it and you worked on technique. So a lot of it is to do, you know, with the coaching and the, and the mentors that you have, you know, growing up and then, you know, if you get a talented kid who you know loves a game, you know he will, he will market the game for you. So yeah. it's a, uh, it's a tough one, and nothing, it, nothing's easy in life. Nothing's easy in life, but it's up to world rugby to to try and market the game, make it, you know, an exciting game. Make changes where they have to make changes to, to you know, make the game maybe more open, um, but net, but then not kind of leave in the the old traditions of the scrummaging around, you know, they're doing it on health and safety. Um, 
and making it safer for kids to play. But um, you know, it's as I said before, it's a contact sport, and there are going to be you know nasty injuries. But um, it's, it's a great game, and the World Cup has has yeah. shown that you know what what it can do. But uh, I think it's just uh, you know development and coaching is at grassroots level is is very very important. Who's been your standout players of the World Cup so far? Um, well, I think um, Penno was a great player. He's did yeah, exceptionally well. Um, I think well, um, what else I think now? Sevilla has been outstanding. Um, South Africa, you know, they've just been such a collective team effort. You know, they they've been it's very it's been very difficult to pick one out out of that side to be honest. Dupont was brilliant. Um Mwanga has been good as well, actually. You know, in in key games, so it's been such a an array of of games um, that it's it's just been enjoyable to watch, really. Yeah, I I have to admit, South Africa are a, a brute force. Razi Erasmus with all of his but not, lip- not yeah, but not only that. You know, no, you you've seen them. You know, there's an uh, adapt or die, isn't it? And I think that the people all of a sudden could manage the ferocity and the physicality of, of South Africa. And then they bring different players in. The centres, you know, any combination they have can play. They can put people into holes, you know, Creel and Arm and all them. Then, you know, the wingers, they, you know, they've got lightning wingers, small wingers, with everyone thought it wasn't right. You know, they've, and then they've ch- chopped and changed a full back as well. So, no, they have, you know they they can adapt and play any game, and then they got the bomb squad on the on the bench as well to come on, and so they 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 can now play any game and they're comfortable at it. And you know the ones that have adapted, I think, are ones that have come through in the end. Yeah, I mean the nuclear bomb squad as well with seven. Yeah, players. huge. They're just yeah, they're just massive. Like you know they're powerful, and but they all can play. That's the difference. They all can play as well. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a very very enjoyable World Cup. It's disappointing that France and Ireland have been knocked out because I enjoyed watching them. But hey, you know you haven't got to be the best side in the world, you know, and um, you've got to be the best side, you know, in the world on the day. And um, when you get the knockout positions, you know, New Zealand have learned that in the past by you know being branded as a chokers, but then you know this time they they they've got it right so far. They're looking very strong, that's for sure. They are. They are. Yeah. And what's been your highlight of the World Cup until now? I think I think the highlight was um I think the crowds have been amazing. I think the French crowds have been fantastic. The Irish crowd has been amazing. The Argentinian crowd I think helped them a lot against Wales on the weekend. So the crowds everywhere I've been has been absolutely amazing atmosphere in all the cities that I've been. Uh, so I've, I think that's been really, really refreshing and encouraging. Uh, the support for the game. Um, I think ultimately the you know the, the two games in the quarterfinals were a standout. You know, Ireland and Ireland and New Zealand and France and South Africa. They, you know, were up there with the best games you know you've ever seen for intensity and skill and um, you know pace. It was just you know awesome to watch, and it was sad that they had to be a loser, but. You know that's that sport. Yeah, seeing Sexton after the match. Hey, it's not you know sometimes they're not fairy tale endings. That's the thing, and you know he knew that, and it all came down to, you know, to one game. And but you know, he'll he'll settle down and think right. You know the, the achievements that he's had in the game. He'll uh, you know he, there'll be fond fond memories, and you know, he'll remember the good times really. But um, unfortunately, on the day that. New Zealand were a little bit better than them. Do you think he'll go down as uh, maybe the greatest ten of all time? Oh, that's, a, I, that's a big call, that is. You know, you uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of different kind of reasons to be the best number ten. You know, if you put Sexton with South African pack, you know, maybe he would be even better. Same thing. If you change and chopped and changed positions, and you know, would would Barry John, what would Barry John be like in that Irish side? What would Phil Bennett be like? You know, what would Johnny Wilkinson be like in the New Zealand? You know, I wouldn't mind playing behind the New Zealand pack now and again. Um, so it's all you know, there are different reasons why you you know 
But I think individually, if you look at all the greatest tens that are that are up there, you know, they're all real, real special players and uh, and have left their mark on the game. So if, again, you go back to opinions. So Johnny Wil- Johnny Wilkinson will be someone's best number ten ever. Johnny Sexton will be someone's number ten. Dan Carter, and then you love you know Barry John, Phil Bennett, another another player. So it's a uh, it's a people have different opinions, but all of those that I've mentioned that are up there, and um, if, even if you even if you mentioned in maybe the greatest player to ever played in that position, you you've done okay. Yeah, that's very well summed up. And who's your best favorite ten of all time? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, uh, I I love you know it's maybe. I played against Grant Fox and Michael Liner, Rob Andrew, Stuart Barnes. Um, played against uh, a couple of great French, you no know, standoffs, Frank Manel. Um, but, but you know, I, I grew up on the back of Phil Bennett. Yeah. So you know, I watched Phil Bennett twice a week in the terrace in Internetly, and uh, then when you watch him perform for Wales and for the Lions. You know, he's the one that you think, oh, if he can do it from the, the village next door, you know, we can do it. And then I was very fortunate to become, you know, a good friend of his. Um, you know, we had a couple of beers together and a good laugh together. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I can't look beyond Benny. Fair enough. I, I don't blame you. But <laughs> keeping it close to home, close to heart, isn't it? Yeah, but I respect all of them. You know, I respect, you know, every one of them. I've been, I've been uh, you know, the ones... John Rutherford was maybe the best I played against from Scotland. Okay. You know, and, and if you put John behind the New Zealand pack, all of a sudden people will be talking about him being the greatest number 10 in the world ever. So it's all different circumstances. Yeah, I guess you could say the same about Finn Russell as well. He's he's an yeah. incredible talent. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Finn's, Finn's adapted very, very well and he's, he's a great distributor and, you know, reader of a game. Um, but unfortunately, against Ireland, they came up against a, a really, really ferocious out of that day. Um, and he couldn't, you know, couldn't get into the game. do all his tricks. So, you know, he couldn't influence it as, as well as he could have. So, but that's down to a team effort. And uh, final question if you had uh, one piece of advice for all the listeners at home, uh, what would it be? Uh, just, uh, just be nice to each other. I think it's. Uh, you know, emotions running high in uh, in the world, in, in sport and, well, you know, in every other place is now. So, uh, yeah, like someone, my dad told me once, it's nice to be important, but it's more it's more important to be nice. Yeah, I, I really like that. I really like that. Is there any yeah. um, anything you'd like to promote um, at the end of the podcast? No, I'm, no, I'm fine. I'm happy as I am. Just uh, life's good, you know, enjoying the rugby. Um, so uh, it's, that's all you can ask for, really. Well, thank you to the audience as well. He's been listening today. Yeah, well, yeah, I know where he is now. He's been squeaking in the background, so he's gone now. He's gone for food. Thank you, Jonathan, as well, for jumping on the podcast. been an absolute pleasure. Um, Cheers. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Cheers. Bye.